Good morning. I'm Denise Cooper, and I am the president of the Inner Source Commons Foundation. Hi, I'm Georg Rütter. I'm the vice president of the Inner Source Commons Foundation. We thought it would be nice to start today with a little bit of information about the Commons because um, we're hosting this event, but also we've been asked by some people to provide more information, so here we are. So first we wanted to start with a little history of the organization. And for that, we're going to go way back to 1948. Well, it's not really when InnerSource started, but that's when computing as we know it today started. This is a picture of the first computer, the, the Manchester baby, so-called. It's the first computer with RAM, actually. They were just running basic math, and software didn't really have commercial or business value attached to it. That changed in the 70s and 80s, as we all know, Microsoft being the prime example. But in 1985, Richard Stallman decided that he wanted a different software world, and he started something called the Free Software Movement, um, which basically ensured that he and other programmers would never lose access to the source code for their work. And that movement has grown exponentially. In fact, um, I think it's pretty well acknowledged today that the world runs on open source software at this point. But about 15 years into the history of open source, uh, we find Tim O'Reilly talking about using those same methods to create proprietary software. And this is something that he called the inner source. Basically, he saw a future where engineering would be done this way. Given enough developers, all software developed emulates the best practices of open source software. And that's the vision that we're trying to enact today. But even though he coined the term inner source, it was really not widely known in the industry. And there was not too much publicity in the years to follow. Uh, but that changed in 2015 with the OSCON, uh, where Denise, who was working at PayPal at the time, doing inner source, uh, had a keynote and explaining the concept of inner source and bringing it back to the stage, so to speak. And that is when the inner source commons community was founded basically and the most visible sign that the community is uh, is up and running and thriving are the summits that we're having uh, today is the 10th summit and i have to say that the community here are some a couple of pictures from people uh, that we recorded in the summits this is a great community to work with and um, it's absolutely fun and it's growing and here are some companies that are speaking publicly about their inner source journey now, for every one of these famous com companies, there are 10 or maybe 50 other companies working on InnerSource but not talking about it yet. And um, that's super interesting to me. I'm always looking for new stories uh, from companies that are making this part of their regime and making inter basically making engineering better for their um, employees and also eventually for the whole industry if enough people do this and we reach a tipping point. So um, we thank the, these companies for being public. Many of these companies are going to speak in the next day and or have spoken yesterday. We also have a fair amount of academic research happening. Um, the book that I wrote, which we'll be talking about in a minute, uh, I co-wrote with someone from the University of Limerick, where there's an institute that's been studying InnerSource for many years. Uh, we had an event at Nui Galway. They also uh, have been studying for a long time. And we also had a meeting in Nuremberg. And basically, there's a ton of academic, well-researched, data-driven research. And we want to see more of this. So it would be fair to say that this is the beginning of the future of InterSource now. And so the rest of this presentation is conversation about how we work and projects that we're planning to work on. First of all, the foundation was established, although we've been working together for five years. Um, in 2020, um, we filed for 501c3 status as well. Uh, very recently, we expect it'll take four to six months to get that information back, but we can behave as a nonprofit starting today. It's a member-based organization on the same mold as Apache Software Foundation. And that's really important because the members actually own the foundation legally. 
Um, we're having our first member meeting uh, next week. Um, it's not open to the public, it's a private meeting, but we do publish minutes and there are several people who've been nominated for membership and that's where they would be voted in. Um, we're also formally starting to look for affiliate sponsors. And if that's something that you're interested in or you think your company would be interested in, these are not expensive sponsorships. We're trying to run as lean as we possibly can on the same model as our friends at Apache who ran on under 300,000 a year for a decade. And uh, I think that we can probably run even more in economically than that because um, we don't have some of the same overheads. Mostly we're organized around creating educational materials and making them freely available. This is our mission, the mission of the foundation and the mission of the uh, commons all along. And that is uh, to stimulate, to develop and distribute knowledge about the practice of inner source and of course support the practitioners and the companies out there who are doing this. We are not like uh, a body who is regulating what inner source means, uh, rather than that, we're trying to develop that knowledge together with the community. That is our prime mission, it's an educational mission. These are the initial board members and these are also the initial members of the organization. And every person on this list has put in so much time and effort to get us to this point. They're, they're all really lovely people as well. I've been very pleased with the growth of this community and the conviviality that we share. It's a humane organization. We're kind to each other. We just help other people understand what has helped us so much. And we're doing it out of love for the practice of engineering. This is how we do work. We work in committees. Uh, that's how work gets done. Um, membership or service to such a committee is also a prerequisite for membership in the Inner Source Commons Foundation. Uh, members will be voted in annually on our membership meeting, the one that Denise just mentioned. And also it's important to note that membership is a lifetime appointment and it should not be tied to the company that you're currently affiliated with. So now we want to talk a little bit about what we're working on, but let me say before we go to that slide, there's nothing wrong with joining the InterSource Commons Foundation just to learn and help your own company. If you don't have the time to grant some work to the foundation, that's fine. We're still happy to have you there, happy to get to know you. Um, we're just explaining how the foundation is going to grow in its core ownership of members. So now a little bit more about what we're working on. First of all, we've got a number of publications that are available. All of these books are available in PDF form on the InterSource Commons website. The one on the far right is written by our good friends at Baturgia, and um, it goes into the in interesting points about the, mem the measurement of InterSource and how to determine whether what you're doing is getting you the, what you need. Baturgia has been a huge member of the InterSource Commons, and we're really happy to have them along. The next book towards the left, Getting Started, is the first book that we produced, and it is 26 pages. It's also available on GitHub, and it is in fact the most downloaded non-code asset on public GitHub. So it's a very popular book. Um, good for giving to um, management, especially senior management, because it's super concise. Um, the next book, Understanding the InterSource Checklist, was written by one of our board members, Salona Bonewald, and it goes into an exhaustive list of considerations for creating a really successful InterSource program. And then Adopting InterSource is the book that I mentioned earlier that I did with uh, Klaus-Jan Stoll from the University of Limerick. It's got some case studies, it's got some theory, and it's also got a whole chapter on practical things to do to get started with your own InterSource journey. And our hope is that you'll find yourself somewhere in that book or the, sit the situation that matches yours you can take it to your management, um, but you can also use it as a guide. Okay, then there's another one, another media that we use as the O'Reilly Learning Path, an online video learning platform from O'Reilly. <clears throat> and we've compiled a number of videos there explaining what InnerSource is, and especially explaining the various roles that are common in InnerSource. Uh, the ones that we did here is product owner, uh, the committer role, and the trusted committer. And it's really worth watching these videos and also important to note the proceeds that we got from that the authors here got from these videos are all donated to the Inner Source Commons Foundation. And that's also true of the books. Um, one more thing, there is a workbook that has recently been produced 
that's got all the scripts that we use to create these videos, plus some questions that you can answer, ask yourself uh, and the answers so you can test your comprehension because people learn different ways. So we're trying to offer all the possibilities. This is the Intersource Commons homepage. This is where you come to figure out what's happening in our world. But it's also where you come to ask for a Slack account. And that's very important because most of the conversations we have and most of the committee work that we do is done through um, Slack. We also have some Google groups. We do have a mail list as well. Um, and, and then finally, there's the patterns group. That's a working group in the inner source commons that's been, that is formed very early on. <clears throat> the idea is to capture knowledge about inner source in the form of patterns, basically problem solution pairs. How do I solve you know, any particular problem that comes up in inner source? And we think that's a, a very useful uh, way to capture knowledge. And as Denise mentioned, we're also planning to write a book and basically summarize all these patterns that have uh, accumulated over the time. Uh, this is a public repository. You can check it out on GitHub. And also, we would like to invite you to contribute your patterns and particular solutions that you have found useful in your adoption of the source. And as to the future, we have a couple of slides here. First of all, we have been talking for a long time about establishing a summit in Asia every year, starting with India. And we had one planned for January this year, but the political situation there kept us from doing it. And of course, now we can't travel. So as soon as we can, we're hoping to reopen this idea and, and go to Asia. And part of the reason that we want to do that region specifically is because there's such a high concentration of people who work in body shop consultancies, the, the really big ones, um, because we've noticed a trend which is that governments who employ those agencies to do development for them that is supposed to be open source often are not getting the open source effect because those agencies don't teach collaboration. That's not how they work. We're also noticing that a number of our members are starting to do translations of our content. It's all licensed under Creative Commons licenses for, for sharing purposes. So that's really exciting to see. We have um, work happening in Chinese and also in French right now that we know of, but we're hoping that there will be more of this kind of work and it's a good way to contribute. We also expect that there will be local chapters, people who want to do regular meetings. And we're also hoping that we will establish more committees, which is why we're asking people to tell us what work they think we should do so that we can organize around that. We may not be able to get to every idea immediately because you know time and, and, and the fact that we're all volunteers are, is, is a thing. But our goal is to serve this community that's trying to learn about Intersource. So it's really helpful if we know what you think is missing. And one thing that we know we need to do is make more matches between um, research institutions and their graduate students that are looking to do research and companies that are actually interested in letting that happen so that we can get to the bottom of really key motivators for doing this. Like, is it really faster after I've spent the time setting it up? So um, we know it is, those of us that have been practicing it, but we don't have good data to show you. So that's what we're going for there. As I mentioned before, we are also going to publish this book on inner source patterns uh, in the coming months, I guess. Um, and we're also trying to be more present in terms of talks. Uh, Denise has a podcast series, or rather her employer has one that she will use to also publish in a source. Um, so if you have an opportunity for us to speak, if you want to invite us, by all means, get in touch with us. We'd be happy to come and uh, tell our story. Uh, and recently, we also established a presence on Facebook, as you can see down here. And lastly, we're announcing a quarterly newsletter and uh, if you go to this URL, you'll be able to fill out a Google form that will put you on the list to receive this quarterly newsletter, which will be um, pretty direct about what's been happening in the foundation and, and with regular calls or asks about how you can get involved. And that's it for this little talk, the little introduction to the Inner Source Commons. And now uh, please enjoy the second day of the Spring 2020 Inner Source Commons Summit.